pray for our country, Lord, as, as uh, we're coming up on elections this year. And we do ask your will to be done. And help us, Lord, not to get all bent out of shape about it because we do know that you're in control. And Lord, just help us uh, uh, during our, our uh, everyday lives here on earth, help us to be a light uh, for you. And just help us tonight, Lord, to open our hearts and minds to your word now. Tonight we'll look at the, the life of Peter and you think about characters in the Bible and, and the Bible is full of folks, a lot of them kind of like us. And you think of Peter, there's certain things about Peter's life that stand out and a lot of people think, well, he denied the Lord. And then, of course, Peter was always bad about saying things a little quick. But uh, I think of Peter as the one that the Lord reached out and saved and the Lord took him and pulled him up, and now they was away from the boat. That's Matthew chapter 14. And they went back to the boat. And I got to think about that. Now the Lord took him, and he grabbed him and pulled him up, and they went back to the boat. So did he walk with the Lord back to the boat? Did the Lord carry him back to the boat? But he got back to the boat. But he is the only one that really volunteered to try that. So it can't be too hard on Peter. But uh, a lot of things, when you think of a character in the Bible, there'll be certain things that come to your mind. If you think about Abraham, you think about up on Mount Moriah, how he took his son up there and was prepared to offer him for a sacrifice of the Lord. You think about these men, and the Lord has used all through the ages, he's used men and women to carry out his will. A lot of these people has been people like Abraham and David that, the Lord gives us so much in God's Word about the lives of those people as, a, as if the Holy Spirit was standing there with pen and paper ready to scribe down the, each moment of the lives of these people. So much was given. And then there's other people in the Bible like Matthias, the, fir the first, the man that was chosen to replace Judas, and then a man named Nicholas, a proselyte of Antioch who we know very little about. But they were still placed there in God's Word for a reason. Now the Bible is made up of, of the, the, the redemption of lost souls. It, from the very beginning, God's plan was to come to Calvary's cross and redeem man who hadn't, he hadn't even created yet. Now you think about planning ahead. The Lord knew from the foundation of the world that His Son would die at Calvary. So the Lord gives us all this information in His Word. And keep in mind, the Bible is an eternal document. It always has been, and it always will be. So it's a perfect record that God has pinned down through the Holy Spirit to give us information about the lives of these people. Now, He tells us in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 11, He said in reference to the book of Exodus Leviticus and uh, Deut Numbers and Deuteronomy, the four books of Moses, he said, these things were written for our admonition on whom the ends of the world have come. Now, they were written. Now, the, these books, when you go into Exodus and Leviticus and Numbers and Deuteronomy, you don't find too many good examples. You find a lot of bad examples. But, you know, that's the way the Lord does it. He gives us probably more bad examples than He does good examples. And He said the reason He done that, He says they were written for our admonition. Now, that means warning. That means counsel. That means firm words. Now, our fathers, they used to give us admonition, but they called it something different. But it's where there's a warning that's given. And the Lord gives us these examples how people react throughout the ages and the reason that he wants us to see that he tells us in Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 12 the last part and he talks about the word of God he said and as a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart so when you study the Bible and you look at these men's life and these women's life and these people that made God's will their will in their life when you think about that there, as we study the lives of these people, the Lord can help us discern our own thoughts and intents in our hearts and spare a lot of grief a lot of times because we know the problems that these people went through. 
and we can prevent the problems because God has given us a warning in His Word. Now, when we look at these things and the night about the life of Peter, we need to think about a couple things about Peter. And Peter is one of the more prominent apostles. Peter and John and James seem to really stand out more than the other nine. And there's probably a reason for that. And maybe tonight we'll be able to see a little bit about that. But the things that we want to look at close is these men... And let's start in Mark chapter 5, and we'll look at verse 37. And this is Peter, James, and John. Now, these three men tend to turn up so many times, and the Lord kind of brings them aside and takes them into these circumstances. And He wanted these three men to be witnesses of what's getting ready to take place. Now, here, we're at the home of Jairus. And Jairus... Uh, he was a man that was called a ruler of the synagogue. And this man had a little girl. She was 12 years old, and she was on her deathbed. And he even when you study the four Gospels, it was as if she had, was dead when he left. She was dying. And then the Lord called. He said, And he suffered no man to follow him save Peter, James, and John, the brother of James. Uh, the brother of James. So here he takes these three men in. And he goes into the room where this little girl was and she had already died since her father came and the Lord raises her up before these three men. They were the witnesses of this resurrection. Now go with us a little bit further in the book of Mark chapter 9 and look here because now we're on the Mount of Transfiguration. Now geographically what you have done, you went north of the Sea of Galilee, you went up to Mount Hermon and this is where this takes place. And he said unto them, Verily I say unto you, that there be some of them that stand here which shall not taste of death till they have seen the kingdom of God come with power. Now these three that he has taken, Peter, James, and John, he takes up into this high mountain in the Mount of Transfiguration. And this same thing is recorded in the book of Matthew chapter 17. But he says, There be some here that stand here which shall not taste of death till they see the kingdom of God come with power. Now the kingdom of God is not come yet. The kingdom of God will come and be established upon this earth after the great tribulation of seven years. So what the Lord does, He takes these men upon this mountain and He transfigures Himself from this Galilean unto the, the Lord God Almighty that will come and establish His kingdom someday. And He allows them to witness the coming of God's kingdom. So He moves them forward at this point 2,000 years that they may be a witness of what's going to happen in the last days. Now the reason that's probably important is one of them men, John, in his latter life when he was around 90 years old was on the Isle of Patmos in the Aegean Sea and the Lord took him by the Spirit and took him up to heaven and showed him all the things that was going to happen. And Brother Wally he got to see that again. Think about that. Peter and James just got to see it one time. John got to see it twice. A man that was probably so hard as bad about sin at 90 years old that he could barely see the Aegean Sea there off the Isle of Patmos was able to look 2,000 years in the future and the Lord showed him everything that was going to happen. So he takes him up there. Another time, over a little bit further in the book of Mark. Let's go over into Mark chapter, uh, where are we at, brother? There it is, 14. Now here, the Lord is right before He's betrayed. And the Lord is in the Garden of Gethsemane. They've been through the Last Supper. He's washed the disciples' feet. They've sung their song. And they're headed out. And they've crossed over into the brook Kitron and they headed into the garden of Gethsemane and the Lord goes out to pray and the disciples he left them there he went a little bit further and then he took Peter, James and John with him and went just a little bit further and they were there sleepy as they were but they was able to witness when the Lord himself took upon him the sins and the burdens of mankind the cup he says that that would pass me, but not thy way, thy will, but not my will, but thine be come. So here they witnessed where the Lord took upon him the burden of the sins of the world. They witnessed the second coming, and they witnessed the resurrection. These three men 
chosen special of the Lord away from the other disciples. Now, this man, John, and this man, Peter, and this man, James, are very, very unique in many, many ways. But let's go to Matthew chapter 4, and let's meet slowly Peter's family. You know, that's kind of tough sometimes when you start introducing folks to your family, ain't it? You kind of wish you didn't have to do that sometimes. We've all got those folks in our family, ain't we? Try to not talk about it till you plumb have to. And he says here in Matthew 4, verse 18 and 19, and keep in mind, is this early in the Lord's ministry, and Jesus walking by the Sea of Galilee saw two brethren, Simon called Peter. Now, Simon is spelled S-I-M-O-N here. That's a Greek version of it. Over in the book of Acts chapter 14, verse 15, it's spelled Simeon, S-I-M-E-O-N, which is the same word, but it's spelled with a Hebrew tint to it. It's like uh, Carl here is C-A-R-L. If you go to Germany, it's K-A-R-L. It's, it's a slant on the same word. So we're talking about the same man here. He says, Call Peter and Andrew his brother, cast in a net into the sea, for they were fishers. Now look close at verse 19. And he said to them, Follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. Now, when you put all four Gospels together, you get a bigger picture of this, as we'll see just in a minute. But keep in mind, here, they go with the Lord, they follow the Lord. But look in John chapter 1, and on your handout, we start with verse 42, but we're going to start in verse 35. Uh, to bring in a little bit more. Now, this John here is John the Baptist. This is that old hard-headed evangelist dressed in uh, camel hair and uh, eating wild locusts. Kind of a country fellow, wasn't he, Brother Walt? You know. And he's standing there, and two of his disciples, yeah, John had disciples, didn't he? John the Baptist had a lot of disciples because the Bible says... When he preached, he says, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. He was preparing the way of the Lord. He said, There's going to one come after me whose shoe latch it. I'm not worthy unloosen. So he was preparing the way of the Lord. If you want to read the rest of the story, the book of Isaiah chapter 40 and 41 will give you a greater picture of John's message. Now the next verse we're going to look at here. He says that one of the two which heard John speak, and that's back in verse 35, and followed him was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. So Andrew was a disciple of John the Baptist. Now look close at that. He said it was Simon Peter's brother. Now go to verse, the next verse down here, 41. He first findeth his own brother Simon and said to him, We have found the Messiah. So he's excited about this. At that point, Peter wasn't with him. He goes and gets him which is being interpreted to Christ, all the Jews of that day was looking for a Messiah. They was looking for one that would come, and this was prophesied in the book of Deuteronomy chapter 30 through 34, of the one that would come, and little was known about this Christ, this anointed, but they were all looking for one that would liberate and bring freedom and peace again to Israel. They was looking for that one, and Simon is told by his brother here, he says, I believe this is him. Now look at the next verse. He says, and he brought him to Jesus. And when Jesus beheld him, he said, Thou art Simon, the son of Jonah. And that word Jonah there, it's, it's a spinoff of the word John. He says, Thou shalt be called Cephas. And Cephas is a spinoff of Peter, which means the same thing. Look close, which is by interpretation a stone. Now on your handout tonight, you'll notice that that Peter means a stone or a rock, and that's the same thing that Cephas is. And then it also, in Simon, his name means hearing or one that hearkens or one that listens to. So these, these names, Peter was listening by his, his, his name Simon, but he also, the Lord established him as someone that is just not listening. He established him as something that would be built upon something that would be a man that would be lay down something that could be built upon. Now we'll see that just in a few moments. Now let's go back to the last verse on that. And now Philip was a Bethsaida, Bethsaida, the city of Andrew and Peter. Now Philip, excuse me, was a Bethsaida. 
Now, go to a map, and you get a map on yours right there, and I love geography. It didn't make very good grades in it in school, but I loved it. I believe I could make better than a C now and <laughs> put a little more time in it. Now, this is the Sea of Galilee. The Sea of Galilee is below sea level, below the sea level of the Mediterranean. Now, when you go up to the top of that up there, on the left, you see Capernaum. We'll talk about that just in a minute. But Bethsaida is on the right side of the Jordan River, which comes in from the top, and the Jordan River is fed from Mount Hermon that we seen up on the mountain in Mark chapter 9 a while ago. The waters off Hermon comes down. It helps create the Jordan River that comes down, and Bethsaida is on the Sea of Galilee, a coastal town, and it means a city of fishers. Got a pretty good name there. Now keep that in mind, and let's go back to what was out there. The house of fishing, excuse me, the house of fishing. And they went into Capernaum and straightway, now we backed up just a few verses because of what I want you to see right here is they went into Capernaum and straightway on the Sabbath day he entered into the synagogue and taught. So they were a Bethsaida, but also there's another thing here because they were also, look close and go to the next verse in Mark chapter 1, he says, And forthwith, when they were come out of the synagogue, they entered into the house of Simon and Andrew. Now, just a minute ago, they was living in Bethsaida. But now, we see them in Capernaum. Now, the thing about that is that they were, their home was in one place when growing up, but then they had a house, and if you'll notice right here, Simon and Andrew lived together. Now, it's getting complicated, too. Andrew and James and John. Now, they're entered into the house of Simon and Andrew, but I want you to look close at the things that's getting ready to happen in this house. Now, the thing, verse 29, is that 31? Yeah. 30, go back 30. Okay. And Simon's wife's mother lay sick of a fever. So you got Peter and Andrew living in the same house with Peter's wife and mother-in-law. So it's getting complicated. But now here they come in and she's sick and anon, that means immediately, and he came and took her by the hand and lifted her up and immediately the fever left her and she ministered to him. She got up and started cooking just as quick as the Lord. Lord, I, that wasn't, he just didn't get her started on recovery. She recovered. But here we see that these people lived in a unique part of Israel in that day. And let's go down to some things about uh, uh, Peter in Matthew ch chapter 26, but chapter 26, verse 73, because he was a social misfit. And if we're going to study about a man's life, we want to know all that we can about this man, Peter. He was a great speaker. He was he done many great things in the Lord, but he was also very awkward and, it, and the problem with Peter is he had an accent now years ago many years ago I went up to Chicago and my cousin we went to the YMCA and we went up there and was going to go swimming at the YMCA pool and I went up there and he said you need to tell that guy you need a basket put your clothes in so I went up there and I said I need the basket he just fell over the counter and he said where are you from of course he said where are you from you know I told him I was from Tennessee. <laughs> well, that kind of gave it away. You know, your accent kind of gives you away. And after a while came into him, they that stood by and said to Peter, Surely thou art one of them, for thy speech bereath thee or betrayeth thee. Peter, you can't hide that. You're one of them Galileans. You live up north up there. You're, you live in that fishing town up there. You're a fisherman, ain't you? You've been following that Galilean. And Peter, you know what happens there? He denies three times. Now, Peter goes on a little bit further. He's, another, he's a misfit in Acts chapter 4, verse 13. Now here, after the day of Pentecost, and Peter has already stood before a multitude of people, Jews, small nations under heaven, and a, a multitude of 3,000 people is saved at the words of Peter. Now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were unlearned and ignorant men. Now ain't that something fine to say about somebody? Now 
Now that didn't really bother Peter. They marveled and they took knowledge of them that they had been with Jesus. You know, that was important. They had been with Jesus. That's more important than what people say about you being ignorant and unlearned. You know, you can take that. If also they recognize, Brother Walsh, you've been with Jesus. That's what's really important. But you know, Peter, he just don't fit in sometimes. We've all got that. And then in the book of Galatians, he really scrambled everything up good. But when Peter was come from Antioch, I withstood him to the face. This is Paul speaking. And this is many years after the day of Pentecost. This has taken place some probably as much as 20 years after that. But when Peter was come to Antioch, I withstood him to the face because he was to be blamed. Now what did Peter do to get Paul on his case? Now look close. For before that certain came from James, he did eat with the Gentiles. Peter was there and he was breaking bread and they was a chucking and a jiving and eating there with all them Gentiles because remember he led Cornelius to the Lord. The Lord used old Peter to reach them Gentiles. Although Peter didn't much want to go, he still went and the Lord blessed him for it. But when they were come, he withdrew himself because James brought all them Jews down from Jerusalem. He withdrew of himself and separated himself, fearing them which were of the circumcision. He just left the rednecks over there and he come over here and started socializing with the folks that came down with James from Jerusalem. Brother Jerry, that happens, don't it? You act a little different sometimes in different crowds. We've all got that problem. And don't act like you don't, because we do. And Peter said, that's why the Lord put this in there is so we can learn from these people's life. Now look close. And the other Jews dissembled likewise with him. Now you know what that means? He caused the rest of them to kind of get over here and leave them old Gentiles over there. They started acting like Peter. That's why Paul withstood him. Look here, he didn't so much that Barnabas also was carried away with their dissimulation. It affected everybody in the room. What's Peter doing? He was talking to us a while ago. Now Barnabas don't know how to act. You know, it caused confusion. Peter was a misfit and it was catching. Now we can't down Peter for that because we've all just like that. But we can learn from that on how sometimes the way we act can affect so many other people. Now, if Peter was also the first one to speak a lot of times. And in John chapter 6, this is getting close to the second year of the Lord's ministry. Anybody got a question right in there? If I was you, I'd have a question. <laughs> okay, John chapter 6. Now, the crowd's thinning out. There's been as many as 70 disciples that the Lord has charged to go out and do to preach the kingdom of heaven. But now it's as if it's whittling down. And he says, But there are some of you that believe not, for Jesus knew from the beginning who they were that believed not, and who should betray him. The Lord was never surprised by anything that happened. And he knew that a lot of these people that was following him really didn't believe. They just liked the bread and the fishes. They liked what came along with it. When they followed him in these crowds, they were some benefits. And the Lord is talking about here that some of them, that's the only reason they was there. They didn't really believe. In verse 65, look close. And he said, Therefore said I unto you that no man can come unto me except it were given unto him of my Father. It means that if the Lord, the Heavenly Father, don't touch the heart of a person and show them Jesus Christ, and they can accept, so they can accept the Lord, they're not going to follow Him. We didn't wake up one morning and decide that we were going to be Christians, did we? The Lord troubled our hearts. He troubled our soul. And we seen a need for the Lord Jesus Christ as our Savior because we were lost sinners. And only the Holy Spirit through the Heavenly Father can show us those things. He said, only accept the Father Show him that. And in verse 66, look close. From that time, many of his disciples went back and walked no more with him. They were disciples. They believed not, and they didn't walk with him anymore. 
Now, what does that let you know? There's a lot of folks that seemingly walking with the Lord that really are not believers. And they, after a while, they quit walking with the Lord. Something to think about. Verse 67. Then said Jesus unto the twelve. See, we got them whittled down pretty good right here. Got twelve. And one of them is the devil. Notice closed. Will you also go away? And then he said, Then Simon Peter answered, because Peter always speaks up. Then Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? Thou hast the words of eternal life. Peter said, Where are we going to go, Lord? They've been, they've been with the Lord now for over a year. Look at verse 69. And we believe and are sure that thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. Now many of the Jews was looking for an anointed Christ delivered to come. But they was blinded to the fact that He was the Son of God. They thought He would be a lineage of the Son of David. That's who they're looking for. They're looking at the family tree. But you've got to look into heaven to see the Son of God. You've got to look higher than the trees. They was looking for the tree, the, the branches of David to come in and give them a deliverer. But He said He is the Son of of the living God. Now notice the next thing in Matthew chapter 16. And when Jesus came to the coast of Caesarea Philippi, and Caesarea Philippi is above, up there, the, the north part of the Sea of Galilee where the Jordan comes in in that particular area there, and it's close to what we know as the Golden Heights, Golan Heights today. Israel was able to capture the Golan Heights region in 1967. If you're old enough to remember that, and that's when they come in and they capture this part of the land and that's part of where Caesarea Philippi joins today and that's down from uh, Mount Hermon. Now, another thing, just a bit of information, before Israel was called Israel in 1948 when it was established as a nation and given the rights as a nation in 1948, before that, from 1920 to 1948, it was called British Palestine. And then it was renamed Israel in 1948. This is the same area. When Jesus came into the coast of Caesarea Philippi, and Him being the Lord and Him knowing all things, think about that. When He goes through Caesarea Philippi and He, he looks forward to 1948 and knows all these things is going to happen, all these wars, you think about that. My goodness, how could He walk through these cities knowing all the things that was before Him there? And He asked His disciples saying, Whom do men say that the Son of Man am. Now, Peter's getting ready to make a great statement right here. And he says, and they said, that's the, the, the disciples, some say that there are John the Baptist. Well, John lost his head, so probably not John the Baptist. Some Elias, that's Elijah, because, you know, they thought, according to Malachi's prophecy, chapter 4, that he was going to come back. So it might be Elias or Elijah. And others say Jeremiah's, and he was a great prophet too, or just one of the prophets. Well, that was the rumors going around. And the Lord wasn't interested in rumors. He said in verse 15, He said to them, But whom say ye that I am? It's not important what other folks believe. What's important is what you believe. We don't get saved on the family plan, and we don't get saved by the church role. We don't get saved because our name's somewhere. We get saved because we have trusted Jesus Christ, God's Son, as our personal Savior. And we trusted Him by faith. He said, with the heart man believeth, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. Folks, it's very simple. We've complicated it. The world has made a mess out of the plan of salvation. It's what it always was. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and I shall be saved. Like that old Philippian jailer many years ago, Folks get saved the same way today. So he says, Who do men say that I am? And here comes Peter. And Simon Peter answered and said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. Now why is that so important? Why is that so important? Now I want to show you what most people believed about that. And let's go down just a little bit further and compared to what the Pharisees thought about it. Now, the Pharisees were the religious leaders of that day. 
They run the religion. Religion was a business. And the Pharisees had control of this. It was a money-making thing, like it is in a lot of towns today. You go to Salt Lake City, it's a business. You go to a lot of the big cities up north, religion's a business. You go to Rome, it's a business. You go to many places in the world, religion is a business, and nothing don't happen without the control and the say-so of the religions in the world today. But he says, while the Pharisees were gathered together, Jesus asked them, similar question, saying, What think ye of Christ? Whose son is he? They said in him, The son of David. Do you see what I say? They looked up the family tree. They was looking up the limbs of that tree, and they didn't look high enough. Peter, that old fisherman from Galilee, he looked above the clouds. He said, Ain't no doubt in my mind, you're the son of the living God. Now, Pharisees, well, he's the son of David. He'll show up sometime. They weren't excited about it because really they'd have been out of business if they showed up. That's the reason they hated the Lord so much and nailed him to Calvary's cross because it was ruining everything for them. But they believed that he was just a son of God or son of David, and Peter knew that he was the son of God. Now, the Lord gives Peter a charge in Matthew chapter 16, and we was almost there a while ago at verse 16, but we're going to go to 17 because there's a charge given because when Peter said what he did, Jesus answered and said unto him, he's talking to Peter, Blessed art thou Simon bar Jonah, which means the son of Jonah, for flesh and blood hath not revealed it in thee, look close, but my Father which is in heaven. Folks, let me say this one more time. The only way a little child can be saved, or an old 80-year-old sinner can be saved is if the Heavenly Father, through the Holy Spirit, by the words of this book right here, touches their heart and they see their need for a Savior. Look what he says, but my Father which is in heaven. That's the only way Peter could have known what he known, knew, was that the Father in heaven showed it to him. And folks, that's the only way people will get saved today is if we present the words of this book to them right here, the Holy Spirit can take those words and produce faith in their hearts and they can trust Jesus. And I love it when a little child gets saved. They had not got all this mess in their life to try to deal with. They can just trust Jesus. And then here we are. You see a man 50, and I'm, I'm witness to a man right now that's about 65 years old. He sees no need for Jesus. He sees no need for religion. He's as good as anybody else. Now, he's a friend of mine, and I befriended him to try it, to plant seeds in his heart. And it's my heart's desire that the Lord would touch him. But only the Father in heaven can do anything about his heart. Only. We cannot persuade men. Only the Father can open the heart. Now, the next thing that he says right here in verse 18 and I say also unto these, talking to Peter, thou, that thou art Peter, and upon this rock. Now we know that's twisted. Today, a lot of churches, they say the rock he was talking about was Peter because Peter means rock. No, it's what Peter said that he was going to build his church on. Is thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. That is the foundation. That is the rock that the Lord built the church on, and look what he says about it, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. That wasn't Peter, folks. Peter folded many times, <laughs> but the church of Jesus Christ built upon the foundation of God's word. Don't waver. The gates of hell cannot win against where the Lord has placed us into his body. Now, let's go just a little bit further on this charge of Peter. Let's go down to 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 4 and 8. Now here, Peter, it's about 20 years later, maybe 25 years later, and Peter's done went through a lot of different things in his life, and Peter's kind of, the highlight of Peter's life is kind of dwindling because Paul was the main character from the book, in the book of Acts from about chapter 11, 12 and on. He comes up in chapter 9 and 10, but he really, Peter, it's, they, they used to say robbing Peter to pay Paul. You've heard that saying there. 
Well, the Lord kind of robbed Peter of the highlight there and made Paul the main one. And the reason he did is because Peter was an apostle to the circumcision or to the Jew and Paul was an apostle to the Gentile, the uncircumcised, and the Jew rejected the message and the, gen- the door to the Gentiles was open, wide open. So Peter's ministry kind of dwindled just a little bit. But both epistles that he writes, First and Second Peter, were written to Jews that were scattered. Men, the tribes of Israel that were scattered around, that was dispersed in that day. To whom coming? Now look close. As unto a living stone. Now he's talking to the Christians that in this particular one right here, northern Asia. Asia Minor, which was above. Paul, remember when he got to Troas, he was going to go into Asia, and the Spirit forbid him not. And he prayed, and the man from Macedonia said, Come and help us. And it turned out to be a woman. But if they said, Come help us. And the lady of the seller of purple was down there. But he went that way. But here, Peter goes that way later, because the Lord knew. He says, To whom coming as unto a living stone... This allowed indeed of men, but chosen of God and precious. The men that, that rejected him, disallowed him, was those Pharisees. Because Jesus Christ did not fit religion and Jerusalem in that day. He was a misfit too. They didn't want nothing to do with him. But the Lord said, He is chosen of God and He is precious. The next verse, He says, Ye also as living stones, talking about the Christians, each one of us as live, lively or living stones are built upon a spiritual house. You remember that one that he said there, that the gates of hell shall not prevail against? He wasn't talking about Peter. He was talking about the Lord Jesus Christ being the Son of the living God. He says, are built upon, on, up a spiritual house, a holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices accepted to God by Jesus Christ. And we know what the sacrifices are. Paul tells us that our, we were living sacrifices. Our life are sacrifices for the Lord. In verse 6, Wherefore also, now look close, it is contained in the Scripture. Now he's going back to the book of Isaiah in this prophecy. And Peter was able, he was a well, he, even though they said he was ignorant and unlearned, folks, Peter knew the book. Don't let nobody kid you. That old fisherman from Galilee has spent enough time in the synagogue he knew the scriptures. He just talked like he was ignorant and unlearned. See what I'm saying? He just didn't fit in. But he knew a lot more than they thought he did. He says here in quoting Isaiah, Behold, I lay in Zion a chief cornerstone, elect, precious, and he that believeth on him shall not be confounded. He'll not be confused. If you believe on Jesus, you ain't going to be confused. The next thing that he says, Unto you therefore, Bert, that's all right. Unto you, therefore, which believe, he is precious. Now, to a believer today, the Lord Jesus Christ is precious. He is precious to me. He's my Savior. Very important. He, is, he, is, he belongs to me. I belong to him. Now, the world, they use Jesus Christ in a, in a slang way. They use Jesus' name just slinging it around. It means nothing to them. But notice what he said. He says, And you therefore which believe he is precious. If you really believe Jesus Christ, God's Son, is precious. He's so important. Folks, we wouldn't be prepared for eternity without him. Notice close. He says, But unto them which be disobedient, the stone which the builders disallowed, remember, away with him, let him be crucified, The same is made the head of the corner. Now, I've done a series of teaching on this many, many years ago, but I'll give you just a touch on it, is when you build a pyramid, every stone that is laid is rectangular until you get to the top. And the chief cornerstone, called the capstone, is a pyramid in itself that tops the pyramid and finishes the pyramid he says, the stone which the builders disallowed, the same as made the head of the corner. On a pyramid, there's five corners. There's four corners on the foundation, and there's one that finishes it on top. And they, I wish I had time, but we'd get a little bit further. Maybe we'll do it someday. Verse 8. And a stone of stumbling, and a rock of offense, 
Now them Pharisees had no use for Jesus Christ because he didn't look like they thought he should look. And you can imagine the guy that's out there, he's trying to find some stones, some blocks to build with, and there's that old pyramid, that old sharp corner. Well, that, that don't fit nowhere, but he keeps stumbling over it. And everywhere them Pharisees went, they stumbled over Jesus Christ, didn't he, Brother Joe? Just made a fool out of themselves every time. He says, even to them which stumble at the word being disobedient, whereunto also they are appointed. The Lord knew, remember what he said, he knew who would believe and who wouldn't believe. It was no surprise to him that the Pharisees rejected him. Now keep that in mind. Let's go just a little bit further. If we don't get done, you've got it on paper there. You can figure it out yourself. We'll give you enough to work with there. Now Peter... His keys to the kingdom of heaven. Okay. Now, we know Peter's not the rock that the Lord built the church on, that the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. But what's the keys to? Now, let's look close at these keys that the Lord gave him. In Matthew 16 again, And I will give unto thee, because he said, that the, Only the Father showed this. He says that he believed that Jesus Christ was the Son of the living God. And he said, flesh and blood hadn't showed you this, only the Father. And I will give unto thee the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Now, let me give you a real crash course in about 10 seconds. The kingdom of heaven and the kingdom of God is two different things. If they wasn't two different things, why did the Lord give them two different names? The kingdom of God has always been and always will be. The kingdom of heaven is a coming kingdom that will be established on this earth that will last a thousand years. That's the kingdom of heaven. When John the Baptist stood before them and said, Repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand, the Lord was offering them the kingdom. And then the Lord Himself come in in the book of Matthew. Matthew's on what deals with this kingdom. He says, Repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand because He was going to offer them the kingdom. And you know what they done? They crucified their king. So the kingdom of heaven didn't come. But then the Lord, after Calvary, after he gave his life at Calvary, after the resurrection, Peter gets to use those keys. Keys, two of them. And I give thee the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whose whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. Because Peter had the keys to unlock the kingdom of heaven to Israel and he tried his best to get that thing unlocked on the day of Pentecost and he says and shall be bound in heaven and whatsoever thou shalt loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven so these keys was a very powerful thing that he was going to have but they were keys to the kingdom of heaven folks it wasn't key, the keys to salvation in essence they were the keys to the kingdom and that belongs to Israel and when we study the scripture well, let, let me show you a couple other things here. Matthew chapter 10, verse 5 and 7. Okay, the, these twelve Jesus sent forth and commanded them, saying, Go not into the way of the Gentiles. Did you know that? For three and a half years, the earth, Lord's earthly ministry, He told His disciples where to go, but don't you go to them Gentiles. And in any city the Samaritans enter you not because they were half-breeds. Remember the woman at the well, John chapter 4. That woman said, why are you talking to me? The Jews don't have no dealing with the Samaritans. Despise her as much as did anybody. But look close. He says, don't go that way. Now look a little bit later at the Syrophoenician woman. A little bit further there, Steve. She'll show up in a minute but rather go to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. That's what he told his disciples. And then the Lord goes to the Syrophoenician woman in Matthew chapter 15 just a little bit later. Now a Syrophoenician is a Gentile. Now what I like about this, he told disciples, don't go there. He said, I'm going to go there. Now that's the Lord's business, ain't it? He can tell us not to do something, Brother Wall, but if the Lord decides to do something, but I want to show you Maybe why he done it. But he answered and said, I am not sent but to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. This is this Syrophoenician woman that, that wanted him to come to her home. Now look a little further here. 
Then came she and worshipped him, saying, Lord, help me. She called him Lord. She, here's this old Gentile woman. She's not a Jew. And why did the Lord even go over her anyway? He left, he, they let the disciples stay back over here. But he, he's going to show us something here. And she started worshiping the Lord. But he answered her and said, It is not me to take the children's bread, talking about Israel, and cast it to the dogs. Now that's how much of a division there was between the Jews and the Gentiles. That's why Peter had such a problem with it. She said, Truth, Lord. <laughs> I agree with you, Lord. Yet the dogs eat of the crumbs which fall from the master's table. Mmm. Hungry. And then Jesus answered and said to her, O woman, and, that, and that's a respectful way of saying it. Don't, don't, don't take that the wrong way. O woman, great is thy faith. Be it even unto thee, even as thou wilt. And her daughter was made whole from that very hour. What the Lord was showing us right there is that the Gentiles was ready to believe. Now the Jews had a terrible time with believing. And when the Jews rejected the Lord, and we only got six minutes here, let me kind of wrap this up, hopefully, in such a way that it'll mean something here. Now, the Jew was commissioned to go into the way of all the world. Go ye therefore and baptize them and teach them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. We, we know there was a great commission. And that was the Jew that was supposed to do that. But the Jew didn't. And the Jew rejected the Lord. And after the resurrection, he, they still rejected that charge that was given in them. And they were some saved. But for the most part, Israel turned their backs. And then he calls on this old Pharisee named Saul of Tarsus. And he said, Paul, give me a new name. He said, your job is to take the gospel unto the Gentiles. Because we know, based on Scripture, that Syrophoenician woman was eating the crumbs off the children's table. He said, they're hungry. Paul went out and Paul branched throughout all Asia. He branched out through all the provinces in Greece. And everywhere that he went, there was multitudes of people saved and churches established because, folks, the Jew... Even, even after that, you remember who had Paul taken and put in prison and shipped to Rome? It was the Jew. The Jew still rejected the kingdom of heaven that was offered to him. So the keys that Peter unlocked on the day of Pentecost and at the house of Cornelius, Cornelius was offered the same thing, those keys was rejected. So was the kingdom of heaven rejected. And then what he does, he brings the apostle Paul in, with the gospel of grace. We're not offered the kingdom of heaven, folks. We're offered eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. I like that a lot better. The kingdom of heaven is only going to be a thousand years. We've got all eternity. I know that's a lot said in a few minutes there, but you need something to chew on the rest of the week, didn't you? Anybody got any questions or comments on anything in there? Surely. Margie, did you back there? Let Joe ask it. It won't, it won't be a bad comment. If you don't sound right, it will. <laughs> well, folks, I hope that uh, you know a little. There's a lot more in there, but take your hand out and finish reading it. But Peter was a colorful man. Uh, he had a lot to, to uh, faults in his life, but boy, I, I can catch myself bragging on Peter. Well, Peter done a lot of things that we're not brave enough to do. And when the Lord reached down and got that old boy right there, he pulled him out of the water and they walked over there. And now the storm was still going according to scriptures in Matthew chapter 14 when they get over there to the ship and get in the ship, then the water's calm. But he walked through the rest of that storm with the Lord's hand, didn't he? Appreciate you being with us tonight. Brother Walt, please close in a word of prayer.
I will this now to the homes of the, of the Lord. Watch over us till we come this way again. We'll be thankful, to the Lord, for what you did for us in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Appreciate you being with us tonight.